Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another intern interview. Today, we are going to be chatting with Dr. Devangi Dave, who is a St. George's University alum like myself. She was one of my former classmates, and she successfully matched into OBGYN at Newark Beth Israel Medical Center in Newark, New Jersey. I am very grateful that she took the time out of her day, out of her vacation at that um, to chat with us today about all things related to OB OBGYN and the application process. Hey, Kate, thanks for having me. It's wonderful. Wow, when you say all of that together, I was like, wow, is that really me? <laughs> you mentioned earlier that you were interested in women's health before you even went to medical school. How did you ultimately decide that OBGYN was the specialty that you were the most passionate about and that that's what you wanted to apply for and do for the rest of your life? Yeah, so that's a great question. I think there were a lot of little clues along the way that led me to it. Um, you know, enjoying my pathophysiology classes, spe uh, specifically about, you know, women's health, whether it was endometrial cancer, or we were studying about, you know, breast masses or whatever it may be. Um, I found that aspect of it very, very interesting. And then when I went into clinical rotations, I had a very open mindset because I didn't really know whether I liked the operating room. I'd never been in an operating room before or whether I wanted to do just clinic. Um, so when I did my OBGYN rotation, I realized it was such a great mixture of both. Um, and I'm one of those people who likes a little bit of everything. So um, it was such a great mixture of clinic and following them up, you know, when they deliver inpatient and then, you know, following them for the postpartum visit or, you know, following your GYN cancer patient throughout their chemotherapy process or, and so on. So I, I felt like that was just such a great fit for me because I could, I could get the best of both worlds in that. Yeah, I think that's a really important point to bring up, um, especially for those who haven't done clinical rotations yet or, and are in basic sciences, because OBGYN is really unique in that aspect where you do get OR time, but you also get essentially floor time when you're on L&D, and then you also get clinic time, which is something that is very interesting about OBGYN, and I think kind of unique to that specialty just in general. Yeah. Um, keep you busy in all aspects, so yeah. that's an important uh, and interesting point to bring up. Uh, kind of going off that, um, so you can do like L and D and just obstet uh, obstetrics in general, and then you can do gyne, you can do gyne onc. Are there, do people tend to specialize in either OB or gyne, or are there a lot of uh, physicians who tend to practice both for the rest of their life? Um, I think there's a lot, you'll find a good mixture of everybody, I think. Um, there's obviously, you know, limited numbers in terms of specialties, like gynonc is one of those very competitive specialties to subspecialties to get into. Um, so obviously you find fewer people in that, but, you know, minimally invasive gynecological surgery, MIGS is really coming up uh, with robotic surgery and everything. So that's a really great field to go into as well. And maternal fetal medicine has been around for so long. Um, with high risk pregnancies and managing these women with chronic high blood uh, hypertension and diabetes and gestational diabetes or, um, you know, or triplets or, you know, IVF pregnancies and so on. So I feel like you can, in terms of people who go into each specialty, I think a lot of people do like doing private practice or going into a mixture of both because I think not unlike myself, a lot of them enjoy both the operating room and the clinic visits and doing these short procedures, their colposcopies in the clinic, and then running over to the labor and delivery floor and doing a C-section. So yeah, I think it's a good mixture of everything. And a lot of people, I don't feel like want to give up either one of those things. So it's, it's tough to decide. Yeah. Yeah. So going off that, you mentioned maternal fetal medicine is a subspecialty. So I presume that's a fellowship you can do after residency. What other types of fellowships are available through ob -GYN? Yeah, there's a lot of uh, specifics fellowships that are available. So the main big three ones are uh, maternal fetal medicine, reproductive endocrinology and infertility, and gynecologic oncology. There's also urogyne, there's also breast surgery, there's also minimally invasive surgery, there's pediatric and adolescent gynecology. Oh. Um, so there's very, very different subspecialties within that. MFM, REI, and um, Gynonc are three-year fellowships, so they take a lot longer. So you would do your four-year residency process and then three years of fellowship versus others like minimally invasive. I think it depends upon which program you go into, but I believe most of them are only about a year. Uh, I think breast surgery is also about a year. 
I'm not quite sure about the number for pediatric and adolescent gynecology, but that's also a great field to go into. Um, and each one of them has their own, you know, unique subspecialty population. So, yeah, that's interesting. I never realized there were so many options for OB/GYN. That's incredible. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's very, very, very specialized. specialized medicine is becoming because it's just impossible to know everything, and there's just so so much information out there that now we have all these fellowships available through like every specialty. It's crazy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's a lot of different routes you can take. Yeah. Do you have any idea what you want to do yet, or you're still not entirely sure? Uh, yeah, I'm not really entirely sure. Um, I think once I do more procedures in the operating room, I think I'll get a better idea. So far, I've loved my time on labor and delivery. You know, it's, it's such a special moment sharing with these patients. Um, so I've really enjoyed that aspect. But at the same time, I've always enjoyed the operating room as well. So I'm excited to see how you know, how I'll test out my skills there and we'll see how it goes. But um, yeah, I think I'll have a better idea, hopefully by the end of this year. Okay. Um, so in terms of applying to OBGYN, it tends to be one of the, how can I say this, the most, one of the most competitive specialties that are within reach for IMGs. Yeah. Um, what did you do during basic sciences to enhance or just contribute to your well-rounded application when it came down to applying for OBGYN? Um, I mean, I think one of the biggest things, you know, they always emphasize, especially as an IMG, is your step scores. Um, and, you know, just building a good foundation for yourself for clinical rotations. Um, that's one of the key things. And I think also research as well is one of those components as well. Having that independent mindset on learning and, you know, um, figuring out, I think during those basic sciences years, you can kind of do your research project in that specific field of interest if you're interested in OBGYN, for instance, as I was. Um, so... I think there's a lot of different components to it, but I would say the biggest one is focusing on your step scores, especially as an IMG. Uh, and in order to do that, you know, you just have to be, get yourself into a good routine starting from day one, you know, um, a lot of that information, you know, I'll look back right now, I still use my first aid as, you know, I'll open it up and be like, I know after I took my step one, I thought I would want to throw it away because yeah, same. <laughs> I, was tired. I was so tired of it. But, but now I'm like, wait, I remember that one page. What did it say about this? And I'll find myself opening through it and looking through it and, you know, feeling a little nostalgic almost about all that stuff. So yeah, I would say setting a good foundation for yourself, you know, being disciplined about how you study. Of course, you know, give yourself time to um, enjoy the time with your friends in medical school and so on. But it's important to set a good routine and a, a good foundation for clinical rotations. Yeah, I agree. That's something I kind of emphasize to everyone who I tend to get questions from when it comes down to what is the most important thing I can be doing in basic sciences. I'm like learning medicine, learning the foundations of medicine. Yeah. I feel like even if you need research, you have a little bit more time because clinical rotations are still time consuming. They're just structured in a very different way, but I feel like you have a little more time to get some research in. So if you can't get it in in basic sciences because you know, you just can't manage research and getting great grades and I think choosing the great grades is always um, always yeah like that's always you know research is always the cherry on top but you got to have the cake first and so that's your you know building up to step one and making sure you have good grades so that was perfectly put I love the analogy <laughs> um did you do research when you were in basic sciences I did do research in basic sciences. I was part of the medical um, school research initiative, MSRI uh, program at offered at SGU. And that was a great program. Um, it was, I actually started doing research in Alzheimer's at that time, which I thought I was interested in neurology. Um, and I did that and, you know, it was a great field to go into, but I realized I was more, I wanted to I like the hands-on aspect of OBGYN more so. So um, that's what I ultimately tended to go towards. But, you know, it really helped me develop like an independent mindset on how I should be um, asking myself questions. You know, if I'm reading through something and it says something like, oh, you know, recent evidence shows this, but more research needs to be conducted. That's something I put in the back of my head and say, 
oh, this is a potential question in the future that needs to be answered. So um, I felt like building that teamwork and, you know, work, having that independent mindset and always inquiring is kind of helps you too in clinical rotations as well. So. Yeah, that's a really great point. And just really quick to touch because I get a lot of questions about how to go about getting research when you're in your basic science years. I guess this will be specifically tailored towards SGU students. Can you talk a little bit about how you either applied for or just got into the MSRI program or like how the whole application process works or if you email someone, I'm not sure. I get a lot of questions on it and I never know what to say because I've never done it myself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So MSRI was, I think they offered, um, they sent out an email, I think our first semester of medical school towards the end and they said you can interview the following semester. So that's what I ended up doing. There was an interview process and that's how they selected um, students who were, and I think there were quite a few of us. Um, for me, it was, you know, just being, uh, having the initiative and emailing the professor that I was interested with. And I said, look, I, I, you know, I saw on the website that you did so and so with research. I'm really interested in talking about it. You know, if you have a chance, I'm, I'd be willing to come to your office and talk about it. So that was just kind of a good way to, um, you know, make yourself known and make connections in that way. Um, but I think that's that's something that you don't necessarily if you even if you were not part of MSRI, you know, that's OK. You can still. And I, I think I know quite a few people in medical school who, you know, didn't have weren't in MSRI, but still were doing research. And okay. it was just because of the connections that they built with yeah. their professors and faculty. So important things is to research isn't going to fall in your lap in basic sciences. You have to seek it out and get it. So start chatting with your professors and see who's working on some research. And that's how you're going to get it when you're basic science. Exactly. Right, exactly. Yeah. So moving on to clinical rotations, is there anything in particular you think you did in clinical rotations that helped enhance your application um, when you applied? I think a lot of people when they start clinical rotations, you know, they think like, oh, I don't want to do pediatrics. Therefore, I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm just going to get my, my shelf score and that's it. I'm out of here. Um, but I think it's so important to give every specialty your best shot. Um, because ultimately I think, of course I had letters from OBGYN faculty at the hospital, but I also had great letters from, you know, internal medicine physicians that I worked with and they knew I wanted to apply OBGYN and they said, oh, you know, they would point out cases to me like, oh, you know, we're actually managing this endometrial cancer patient, you know, we're managing her electrolytes and, you know, she has a pneumonia picture now. Why don't we go? I think you'd find this, find this case very interesting. Um, so it was through connections like that, that, you know, I was able to stand out in my clinical rotations. Um, so you don't always have to, you know, um, when you start out clinical rotations, I would say have an open mindset and give every specialty your best shot because it's the connections you built along the way, you know, um, those faculty can vouch for you and say, you know, I, it's, I would love to have her in my field, but you know, it's, it's great that you're getting a great student here. You know, you're getting a great member. So that was, that was great to hear from, you know, some of the surgery faculty that I worked with. Um, they said, it's, it's, I'm really sad you're not applying to surgery, but I'm happy to write your letter of recommendation for OBGYN for you. So that was great. Yeah, I think that's a really important point to um, bring up because I, I'm always telling people that your cores are your cores for a reason. Whether you are interested in them or not, they are important. They're cores because you're going to use them. Um, so I'm glad that you brought that up to kind of kind of back up what I am <laughs> normally saying. Yeah. Um, my advice doesn't seem fraudulent, but um, yeah, that's, I think, very important. You have to put your best foot forward in all of your rotations because like you said, even if you're not interested in that particular field. You don't know who knows who. Um, exactly. Perhaps, you know, your, your internal medicine attending is best friends with the OBGYN program director at the program or at some other program. Maybe they went to medical school together. Like, you don't know. So yeah. it's, it's important to put your best foot forward in all of your... Medicine is a small world. It's a small world. It is a very small world. There might be a lot of us, but it's a very small world. Yeah. Um, so also in terms of your rotations, do you have any tips for students who are looking to um, apply for OBGYN uh, for their OBGYN rotation? How can they stand out? How can they go to get a good letter of recommendation? Um, I think the main aspect that you can do is really, you know, be proactive in your rotation. 
um, ask questions, you know, study the material um, that you're provided, but also build that relationship with your faculty, especially, you know, your clerkship director, whoever they may be, let them know when you start that I want to apply OBGYN, you know, and they'll keep you in mind, say, you know, I want a letter of recommendation by the end of this. So let them know ahead of advance. Um, and, you know, ask them about what can I do to make myself stand out throughout my core rotation and beyond if I were to come back for an audition. Um, and, you know, they'll, they'll vouch for you. They'll, you know, help you figure out, you know, how to apply and so on. So um, I think that's one of the, I think that would be one of the tips I would say is it's very important to make connections with your faculty in that way. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think that's important in every field, but in particular, OBGYN like programs tend to have very small classes. And so that leads me to believe that the number of spots available are not as many as, for example, internal medicine or family medicine, where there are, are so there are so many positions available, whereas yeah. OBGYN seems to be a little more limited. So develop, developing those relationships with your preceptors, with your attendings, not only can help you out at that specific program that you might be rotating at, but again, like you don't know who knows who. So uh, very important, very important. Yeah, absolutely. So before we talked about step scores, um, I usually look at the average step score for every specialty and it looks like OBGYN um, average step score for IMGs and US students alike tends to be in the low to mid 230s. Um, just to give people a general estimate of how you did, did you do above the OBGYN average, below, about the same? I, I, I did above the average, but, um, you know, it's, I, I, there's so many, I mean, it's an average, so there's a lot of people who do below it as well. But and I don't think that's the main key factor that helps people stand out. I think it's also progression. Like a lot of interviews that I had, they also asked me about my step two score and how it was in relation to step one. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's also a key component, whether you improved. So if there's a significant improvement in your step scores, you know, that's also a big deal. Um, it's also, yeah, I would say, you know, step one is absolutely very important, but there's also differences coming now in how step one is going to be graded. Yeah. So that's, so step two is going to play even a bigger role now. Um, so I think it's, especially in step two CS as well. So it's really important to keep that in mind. Yeah, I agree. Um, that's sort of what I, I try to enforce to people because I think a lot of people get discouraged when they're like, I want to apply to a more competitive specialty like OBGYN or surgery. And they're like slightly below the average score. And that doesn't mean you're not going to get interviews. Like you said, the average is an average for a reason. There are plenty of people above. There are plenty of people at the average and there are plenty of people who are below. So I, I think not letting yourself be discouraged by the fact that you did like a few points lower than the average is, is definitely not something you should use to shy you away from applying ob guide or discourage you from applying for a more competitive specialty. Um, and like you mentioned, trend is very, very, very important. As long as you show improvement, I think arguably CK might even be looked at more favorably upon now because like you said, things are changing, but also it's more clinical. And I think a lot of programs actually care about that quite a bit yeah. um, because it, it's more, it's more so, relevant to what you're going to be doing in residency. Yeah. In fact, you know, uh, back to your previous question too, with my clerkship director, she emphasized as soon as I let her know that I wanted to apply OBGYN, she was like, okay, well, you need to do well on your shelf. You know, make sure you do excellent, make sure you pass it with honors. Um, and, you know, she followed up after with me, like, did you do well? You know, just wanted to follow up with you. Um, so that's something that's also very important is your shelf score, you know, don't take that lightly. Yeah, that's a good point. And I think, Doing well on your shelf exams for whatever you plan to apply for is important, but also reminding yourself that, yeah, shelf, shelf exams are like curved in a sense, but honestly, they're like mini CK exams. If you prepare for those, like you're preparing for CK literally every six weeks, when you finally get to CK, there's no reason for you to do poorly. Like you will more than likely do very well on CK if you're taking right. your shelves very seriously and you're doing well on them. So right. like you said, like that is a positive trend. Like once you go from step one, like if you can just keep climbing uphill just a little bit, um, each rotation all the way up to CK, I think that puts you in a very good position regardless of how you do on step one. Right. Absolutely. Um, in terms of audition rotations, did you audition anywhere for OB? Yes, I did. I did, I think, 
was it two? Yes, I did two audition rotations only. Uh, one of them was at where I did my core at St. Barnabas Medical Center. And then the other one was at Jersey Shore University Medical Center. Um, those were the two big programs, I think, in New Jersey that were offered to SGU students. My current hospital where I'm at, I actually didn't do OBGYN there at all. Um, I actually did my surgery core rotation there. And during that time, you know, I got connected with some of the OBGYN attendings and I would always sneak into the operating room on their cases and, um, you know, introduce myself there. And they realized, you know, there were multiple um, SGU alumni in the program too. So it was great connections to make. And, you know, they knew I was interested because I, I told them in my core rotation more than a year before that I was. Um, so yeah, I did those two, uh, two audition rotations. One of them was in Gynonc and then the other one was in MFM. Okay. So maternal fetal medicine and the other one was gynonc yeah okay and did you do a sub i in ob or no that was my sub i yeah so those were oh. my sub i rotations but they give us subspecialty rotations within both and they were both vastly different um oh. gynonc was more you know just um you'd be in the operating room all day and you'd round in the morning you'd have your chronic patients there you know who've been there for treatment of their cancer for many, many days versus MFM, you know, you do the ultrasound, you'd manage their diabetes and you'd send them back. So it's a lot of outpatient stuff. So right. um, both of them were very different. Okay. And do you think that your audition rotations helped you in terms of obtaining interviews and matching or not so much? Yeah, I think they definitely help you in, you know, getting an interview. Um, I think it can go either way in terms of whether you match there. Um, you know, it's, very important to always set a good have a best foot forward in either of those scenarios um both my audition rotations i did i really enjoyed them both and it allowed me a great chance to you know interact with the attendings there specifically in those subspecialty fields um and you know get good letters of recommendation from them too so that was a great opportunity um and i think i learned so much from both of those audition rotations um, because I realized they were both vastly different and I could talk about it during my interviews and say, you know, I, you know, I had a really difficult case in this gynoc procedure that I did. And, you know, um, and even in maternal and fetal medicine, you know, I, the patients I managed and it was nice following up with them every week when they came in and for their weekly BPPs. And it was nice to see that they were actually starting to take their health seriously and, you know, take their insulin on time and so forth and so forth. So, yeah, they were both really great. And I think it allows you the opportunity to talk more about OBGYN in, in, in your interviews. Yeah, I think that's a really great point, um, especially because, like you mentioned, they are very different. Like one's more um, like inpatient based, one's more outpatient based. So it kind of gives you like uh, the comparison, the contrast for you to talk about on interviews. And then when they hit you with the, well, what do you want to do in the future? Are you interested in fellowships question? At least you have like kind of, you may not know what exactly you want to do, but at least you have a little bit of a foundation to answer that. Yeah, you can say, well, you know, I really enjoyed this aspect of the subspecialty rotation audition that I got to do. Um, so maybe, you know, in the future, I would like to do something like that. So, yeah, I think the other benefit that may come from that, too, is you matched in New Jersey and both of your other auditions were in New Jersey also. And yeah. Again, you don't know who knows who. Like, I feel like New Jersey's not, I mean, it's not a small state, but it's not a huge state. So, yeah, yeah you never know. Maybe there's connections that can be made um, wherever you decide to do your rotations. Yeah, there's the graduates from, you know, programs who've gone down, they, you know, that the, their fellowship after residency, and they, you know, went somewhere else for their own uh, private practice. And, you know, you'll say like, oh, you know, I went this place for, I did my core rotation. They're like, oh, I graduated. I was a resident there back in 2004. Like, <laughs> that, so it's crazy seeing, you know, how, how far they've traveled and, you know, where they've gone in their journey, in their career. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, in terms of, I know you mentioned earlier that you did do research in basic sciences for sure, um, which pro probably enhanced your application, absolutely. But do you, how do you feel um, research is in terms of an important factor for either getting an interview or matching into ob -GYN? Do you feel like it's very important and you absolutely should have some? Or if you don't have any, it's not going to hurt you? I think it doesn't hurt you in terms of getting an interview 
However, I think getting past the interview and matching there, it really helps. Um, because during your interview, you can talk about how you, you know, you did so-and-so research in OBGYN. And, you know, when they hit you with the question, like, well, what do you want to do in the future? You can say, well, you know, I actually did this research project on bariatric surgery um, and women, you know, in getting internal hernias after their bariatric surgery while they're pregnant. And so how do you manage it? And, you know, you'll find that you're able to talk in your interviews a lot better about the the knowledge and the foundation you have within that field already um and i think it makes you more relatable more it makes your application more um how should i say more stronger um in that way that you you know you've decided that this is what you want to do and it's not just oh well you know i just want to help people because i think that's a generic answer that a lot of people give and you want to you want to talk a little bit more about how you can help those people yeah, that's actually a really great point to bring up because I think a lot of people to do research kind of just to do research and go through the motions, not necessarily with the mindset that you actually can help people. And the interesting thing about researching in comparison to like clinical medicine is clinical medicine, you are, you're executing the research. But it's interesting to be on the other side and have the experience of like being behind, behind the scene. Yeah, so I, I think yeah, I think having a, a better mindset about it, if you're doing it just to go through the motions, that's maybe not the best way to go about it, but yeah. yeah. And even during your clinical rotations, you know, uh, like I said, keep an open mindset. Like a lot of the research I got wasn't in my OBGYN rotation. It was actually my surgery rotation. And I let my, my surgery attendings I was working with know in advance, like, Hey, I'm actually going to be applying to OBGYN. And as soon as they were, you know, doing a bariatric surgery on a pregnant patient, they were like, Oh, we should do a research project about this. You said you were interested in OB, right? So, and that's how it all started. So, you know, it's always, you know, always be honest about what you are interested in, but also also have an open mind about it. So. Yeah, I agree. I think that having an open mind is one of the most important things you can do uh, as, as a med student, because even uh, for example, like ob guy is six weeks long. Surgery is 12 weeks long. That's a lot longer. Um, and I think you have a little bit more time, not only to develop the relationships, but also get some research in six weeks is, is a pretty short time span to try and yeah. get to know people and try and make a relationship and get research with the person you build a relationship with. That's a lot. And good, get good shelf grades. Yeah. It's a lot. Yeah. It's a lot going on in six weeks. I think 12 weeks is definitely a more reasonable, um, aspect. And so I think that that's a really great tip to bring up that use your surgery rotation because ob is essentially half, half of a, um, surgical specialty. So, or more. So I think that is a really great point to bring up and hopefully, hopefully pe people find that advice very useful. Yeah. How big are ob programs roughly? Like large, small? Um, like like? Most programs that I, you know, apply to, I feel like three or four residents per year per class. Um, I think the max number with a lot of mergers that recently happened is I think 10 was the largest program that I interviewed at. Um, so most are, most are really, really small. So only up to four people per class. Um, but you know, even with the 10, they were dispersed, I think at two or three different hospitals. So, um, so those can be, it's still like a very small program. Cause if you're only, you know, if you're considering three different hospitals, it's only about three residents per place. So, yeah. So does that make, obviously, matching into ob on match day is really all you care about. But did, was the thought ever in your mind that like, oh, my class might only be three people large. What if I don't like any? <laughs> yeah, you know, that's obviously, match day is so nerve wracking. It was, but it's, I actually ended up matching with one of my really good friends from med school. And it was such a surprise to the both of us. Yeah. Um, so I matched up with uh, one of my friends from med school who I knew was also applying to OBGYN and we'd interviewed together and so on. So it was great to, you know, have somebody along the way who went through the same, you know, ups and downs of the match day and applying and all of that and be there with you. So, but yeah, that's certainly a, a thought that you have, but I think during interview day, you get to, you know, figure out what the people are like and um, how they work together, their interactions with each other. Um, and every residency program, you know, you're going to have your ups and downs in each one, but it's the most important thing is, you know, starting fresh the next day with an open mind, you know, forgetting about the previous day, not take that into consideration, focus on the patients in front of you at the moment. 
Yeah, I agree. And like we were talking about before, having a good support system is so important, um, especially like you said, when there's only three or four of you per class. Um, and I think that's one thing that's unfortunate about interview season this year. I mean, the great thing is everyone's going to be saving a ton of money. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> but I think it's really, I feel like it's going to be really hard to get a sense of, you know, what people are like there and you're not really going to get to interact with other candidates. Um, through Zoom, I don't think. Maybe they will. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, um, I don't know how, how they're going to restructure it, how, gonna, how they're going to structure it. It's going to be interesting to see. Yeah, I don't know. I feel like that makes me nervous because I went That's off my gut for Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how, how you would do interviews on Zoom with like multiple candidates and Same. You know, all the residents there together. So that'll be interesting to see. We'll see. Uh, yeah, I'm, ex I'm excited to hear how it goes. I'm for sure excited. Yeah. Um, how many ob programs are there, out of curiosity? I think when I looked on ERAS, there were about 200, upper 200s. I think there were like okay. above 250s. Okay. Yeah. How many did you apply to as an IMG? I, I applied between 180 to 200. If I okay. Remember. Did you apply for a secondary specialty or no? Um, I applied for a preliminary for internal medicine because I didn't know what you know, I was like worried that I wasn't going to get a, any OBGYN interviews in the first place. Um, and so, you know, when I did my, when I did prelim interviews as well, you know, I let them know that that would be the future. That would be what I want to go into. Right. Um, and a lot of them were very open about it. So that was great. Um, but yeah, I would, I would say for mo looking back in retrospect, I would probably have applied to a little bit less than that. But I just wanted, I didn't really have much, uh, I did have a geographic location on what I wanted to be. Like I knew I wanted to be the Northeast. The South was fine with me too, but I knew I didn't want to be up towards like North Dakota or South Dakota. Like I knew that was not the geographical location that I wanted to be at. So I narrowed it out based on that. But I also did, you know, looked at um, on the SGU alumni directory, you could figure out where people have been and I would send them messages and email them and so on. And, you know, you kind of get, I especially applied to those places, emailed the programs over there. Right. Huh. So that's really interesting that you didn't apply to a secondary specialty. And I say that because I think often when people apply to secondary specialties, no one expects to actually need them. I mean, they do because that's why you're applying for a secondary specialty, but I think a lot of people wind up upset when they match into a secondary specialty, meaning that that's not really what they wanted. And I think that I, I'm very, I'm interested that you applied to prelim internal medicines and ob rather than ob and a secondary specialty, because that, I feel like that does show that you are willing to go for one year, the prelim year, and then reapply into ob because you don't. Yeah anything else I think that's I've never thought of that that's genius <laughs> I was like well I mean you know they a lot of prelim programs you know a lot of people would also do a transitional year I should have, I mean you I guess you could do that too but I I enjoyed my internal medicine rotation so I knew that that would be something you know I would have enjoyed working there it wouldn't you know, but I knew eventually I did want to go into OBGYN. And so I think the programs actually really appreciated that sort of honesty. Yeah. Um, so. No, I think that's an absolutely great approach. I honestly, I haven't heard of anyone who's done that. And I think that it makes the most sense because then you can still wind up where you, you where you ultimately want to be. You don't have to go through a residency that you don't even like. Yeah. And I think applying a secondary specialty is very important as an IMG, like at, even if it's a preliminary or whatever, you know, categorical place, whatever it may be, but because ultimately, even if you don't match into your primary specialty, you're still getting clinical experience from that. You're learning Absolutely. how to manage patients. You're learning how to interact with patients and give excellent patient care, which I think ultimately at the end of the day, if you do end up reapplying to OBGYN, that's fine. You know, you can use that clinical basis in from your prelim year, whatever it may be, and talk about how that makes you a better OBGYN resident. Yeah, I, that's absolutely incredible. I'm still like mind blown. Like I've never heard of anyone do this before and I, I never thought of it. That's, that's amazing. Yeah. I think a lot of people will value that because a lot of people get nervous. They're going to match into a specialty they don't like. Yeah. So I think that is a really great alternative. Thank you for that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so moving on to 
ranking and that uh, kind of category. What personal qualities about yourself do you think made you rankable or just a good all around applicant in general? I think a lot of the places where I interviewed at had kind of already, um, I'd emailed them before in advance, you know, so they knew I had the initiative for it. Um, the place that where I matched at, they'd knew me for, not known me for my core rotation, and they remembered me as the girl who would sneak from the surgery cases onto the cases. <laughs> so, yeah, so it was something that, you know, they'd known about me for that, and so they knew I had the initiative for it. So I think being having that sort of initiative and you know talking about what you want to do even in your other specialty rotations um on your other core rotations kind of helps you make those connections and um, stand out as an applicant when you're there on interview day because you know everybody who's there at the table has great grades you know they're great with working with teams you know um, and so on. So I think one of the best ways to stand out is, um, you know, research. If you have that, that's a great point, but also showing that you have initiative that, you know, you're willing to take that extra step, um, to show that you're a great candidate or show that you're detail oriented and, um, make, willing to make connections. Yes. All very great points. Having initiative is something that is necessary, honestly, no matter what field you're trying to go into, um, it's a lifelong learning process and the learning curve intern year is very steep and you have to have the initiative to learn. <laughs> so yeah, you have to read about your patients. You know, this is something I didn't know about today. So if, when I go back on the floor tomorrow, I should know how to do this better. Um, so always having that mindset about improvement and what can you do better the next day is something that also helps you stand out. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, what do you think programs are looking for in particular in an OBGYN applicant? I think one of the biggest things is, you know, is, is teamwork. Um, I think that's a really big key point. Like, are you, do you have a good mindset about, you know, taking criticism and reacting with it in a positive way and taking a learning point out of that and improving upon it the next day or in the, in the next clinical scenario it may be. I think those are the two big components that they look at. Um, when it comes to, you know, obviously they want um, great scores and all that to make sure that you have the clinical foundation for it. But I think on interview day, they're li really looking for the interactions with you are they going to enjoy working with you for the next four years there? You know, and I think that's the answer. That's the question you have to answer on interview day um, for them is, are you willing to work with the team, you know, despite having rough nights or whatever, are you willing to take, you know, a positive note out of that and come back the next day and do better? Um, so I think that's the question you need to answer. And that's what makes you, I think, stand out um, as a competitive applicant. Yeah, that's a really great answer. And I think a lot of people forget that medicine is such a collaborative effort. Um, there's really no individual, like sure, like, you know, oftentimes attendings are the ones making the ultimate decision, but they may, a lot of times they make the ultimate decision based off of a lot of feedback from the residents or another attending they collaborated with or some input from nursing. Like there's just a lot of people that you're working with that help drive decisions for patient care. So being a good team player is something that is very important. And I think it's, it's no surprise that it would make you a, a highly rankable applicant. Yeah. Um, what was the most commonly asked interview question for ob -GYN, if you don't mind me asking? <laughs> um, I think a lot of them were, you know, very generic, like why ob -GYN? They just wanted to figure out why were you there in front of them and to, you know, why this program, what, why do you think this program is a good fit for you? Um, the other question I got asked a lot was, you know, tell me about a difficult case that you had. I think that's just to probe on to, you know, how much do you actually know about this field sort of, or are you just applying into it just because you think you like OBGYN or is there a specific case that you, you know, made you jump and say, this is why I want to do it. Um, so I think those would be the three most common questions that I got asked. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, it, it's sort of similar across all specialties, but I really like the the last one where having a case prepared um, that kind of makes you a little more passionate is a great. Yeah, a great that's something you have to prepare for. You know, interviews, people take it like 
so lightly like, oh, oh, of course I know my CV. I know my resume. What's there to know? But you need to have answers prepared to these questions. Um, and, you know, make sure your answers are strong and they are concise and to the point. Um, and they are good answers that they, you know, answer the question basically. Yeah, I agree. Did you have any like medical or like weird questions that you encountered on your interview trail at all? I don't think I had. Oh, I did have like, oh, if you didn't want to, if you didn't do medicine, what would you do? And I said, oh, I guess I would do, I would be a chef. And they were like, oh, that's really interesting. That's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me more about that. And I was like, well, I enjoy cooking. They were like, you're hired. Like, if you like cooking, we're willing to eat. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. No, I've never been asked that before. I did have a few weird questions, but I've never been asked what I would want to do outside of this. And I don't even know what I would say. I wasn't prepared for that. I'm glad you had a good answer, though. That's awesome. Yeah, I was like, I guess I enjoy cooking and eating. So it would probably be something along those lines. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, and then the last question I have for you, uh, actually, I have two more just because I thought of another. OBGYN is four years long for residency. Um, a lot of four-year programs have a prelim year of either surgery or medicine, but OBGYN does not have that. It's just four straight years of OBGYN. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. I just wanted to make sure. Um, there are some OB programs that have a, offer a prelim position, but okay. so the interesting thing is that a lot of those prelim programs, um, the few that I interviewed at actually you... So OBGYN has its own specific database where you can, if you finish a prelim year, you're still given a certificate at the end saying you've completed PGY-1 of your residency year. And when you go on the database, you can find PGY-2 positions and you're eligible to apply to them. Um, so you don't have to do your first year all over again. And I think that's kind of unique for OBGYN prelim programs that you can go on and match into PGY-2 at any other program. Um, so I felt like that was, that was interesting to find that out. That was really interesting. So after you complete and get your certificate in the PGY-1 OBGYN prelim year, you don't have to reapply through ERAS. You just look in this database for PGY-2 spots. Yeah. I mean, you can apply to, through ERAS if you like, and you want to go through that again, you're more than welcome to do that. But we were told that on those prelim interviews that, you know, they would try and find you a position, um, PGY-2 position that would be, you know, they'd be willing to write you a letter of recommendation and, you know, uh, help put you in a good standing for that position. Yeah, that's really interesting. I never had any idea that existed. Hmm. Yeah, there's very few of those programs, but they are there. Yeah. Is there anything else, I guess, unique to the OBGYN application process that you, you feel is like different compared to what everyone else went through or not so much? You think it's about the same? I think it's about the same. I think, you know, obviously, I think the interviews can be kind of, I think I had a few interviews where I did have to like suture and so on. They were just trying to test your skills, I guess. So that was, you know, you have to be prepared for that sort of when you, you know, make sure your sleeves are not fully like in the way because you're in your suit and everything. So those are the only other, I think, differences. But overall, it was pretty much the same as every other applicant, you know, the same standard questions and, you know, just getting to know you better, the conversation with the residents and so on. So, yeah. Okay. Um, so the last question I have for you is what do you feel like the biggest struggle was that you faced as an IMG and how would you overcome it? And what advice would you give uh, people who are encountering a similar challenge? I think as an IMG, you know, you face a lot of stigma um, about, especially when you apply to competitive specialties and to programs that have never had an international medical graduate there before. Um, and a lot of them will, you know, kind of not not respond or you won't get any feedback from them at all. Um, one of the things I did was I think almost every program in the Northeast I emailed and I, you know, sent a short blurb about myself, like I'm so-and-so applicant, AMC ID number, whatever. I'm interested in your, in your program specifically because of this, this, and this. Um, I'd love to learn more in an interview setting. And that's what I said to them. And I felt like I got a great positive feedback from that. Um, a lot of them actually said, you know, actually we don't have a spot right now, but email me back in a month, maybe we, we will have one. And that's, I felt like that's something you can do as an IMG because that shows initiative. It shows why you're interested in the program, not just like, hey, I'm an OBGYN applicant, here I am, 
can you give me an interview? It shows that you're interested in their program. So it's, it's kind of works as a two way street in that sense. Yeah. I think that's a really important point you brought up also because IMGs do tend to apply to more programs and apply, apply more broadly because we want to increase our chance of getting an interview because that increases our chance of matching, which is what we want. Um, because you know, the statistics aren't the same for us matching as it is for our U S counterparts. Um, but I think sending generic emails to multiple programs is not helpful. It's, it's as helpful as applying broadly to all of these programs, um, that you don't even necessarily know if you want to go to, you're applying because you need interviews so that you can match. So I think emailing programs with specific reasons why you want their specific program not only shows initiative, but it shows that you're interested in them, not just the specialty, but in them. Um, so yeah. I think that's absolutely great advice. I think you can also, you know, take it a step further. And I actually put um, it in my personal sp statements. I, for the programs that I really, really wanted to go into and I really wanted to match at, I put in, you know, a specific reason why at the bottom of my personal statement, why I'm a great fit for their specific program. So I would go on their website, you know, read about their mission statement, why they, you know, they did so-and-so research project or la la. And I would say, well, you know, I'm really interested in maternal fetal medicine. You know, as I talk about my case earlier with this patient interaction that I had, um, you know, I think I would, I would, I would be a great team member in this, in this setting. Uh, and that's why I would love to be part of your program. So I think that's also helps you stand out because when I was there on interviews days, they would be like, Oh, wow, you mentioned like, this is a specific personal statement. Like I was like, yeah, because I really want to be here, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I think that that is absolutely fantastic advice. Um, it definitely doesn't hurt to email. It definitely doesn't hurt to pick up the phone, but definitely be prepared to mention why them and not why anybody. Right, exactly. So that's all of the questions I have for you. Do you have anything that we didn't talk about that you might want to share with future OBGYN applicants or any applicant in general? I think the main thing is, you know, just stay positive. Um, interview process is long it's tedious there's a lot of ups and downs you just keep your mind in it you know it eventually ends <laughs> um and whether or not you end in the specialty you know if you if you do match into a secondary specialty it really doesn't matter because at the end of the day you're getting great clinical experience um and you know you really have to keep that in mind um so i would say yeah just stay positive stay focused you know do well in your exams, you know, make good connections. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. Okay. Well, thank you so much again for taking the time out of your day, your intern year and your vacation. Um, <laughs> I know that so many people are going to find this very helpful. Um, it was so nice to learn more about OB guy and application process, because honestly, I feel like I learned a lot from this. This was interesting. Yeah, absolutely. It was so great. You know, it's, chatting with friends after so long and you know going through inter intern year together it's like wow everybody around the country is going through the same thing like I'm not the only one who doesn't know what I'm doing I feel right. <laughs> we're off the list <laughs> <laughs> yeah well thank you so much again it was great having you on here yeah absolutely love talking to you Kate that was great